this little video that I've recorded is uh, designed to deal with an issue which I come across quite regularly with uh, with my my AS students, and that's the fact that they they find it difficult sometimes to see the relationship between what they've studied so far in the market forces and supply and demand, and the next part of the course which is market failure, um, and and they often view it that it's kind of an entirely new bit of content with entirely different diagrams and and so on. So the intention with this video really is to demonstrate how. Uh, what you've studied already, which will be the supply and demand diagram that you can see on the screen, how that relates to uh, the next topic that you're going to be moving on to, which is the topic of market failure. So let's just think about a little bit about what we've looked at so far. Now we've looked at so far the downward sloping demand curve and the upward sloping supply curve. Uh, you can watch earlier videos if you want to understand a little bit more why they slope in that particular direction. Um, and we've also seen that there's a point of equilibrium where they cross and that 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 gives us what we call the equilibrium price and the equilibrium price is the price where the market clears so at this price uh, the amount of supply is uh, the amount of good being supplied is Q the amount of the good being demanded is also Q so the market clears um, what we need to think about when we look at the market failure really is information which is not being taken account of when these decisions are being made. So when we've got the firms, remember it's the firms that do the supplying, so when we've got the firms deciding whether to supply a unit or not, and when we've got consumers deciding whether to uh, buy a unit or not, we need to think about what what information they are taking into account and what information they're not taking into account. Now for most things, um, if we think about the consumer, when you think about buying something, you are thinking about the benefit that you yourself will receive from it. Um, so what we say is that the demand um, is the marginal private benefit. And what we mean by that is it's the benefit, which is the B, that you yourself, the P for private, receive from one additional unit, which is the marginal. So your demand is your marginal private benefit. They're, they're the same thing. Um, so demand is equal to, to MPB. They're really just different names for the same thing. Um, at the same time, we think about the firms. The firms, when they're deciding whether to produce or not, are taking account of the costs to themselves of one additional unit. So the costs to themselves, private, um, of one more unit marginal. So adding on the MPC and MPB labels is really just elaborating slightly on what demand and supply is. They, they, they are the, the, the same concepts essentially, we're just thinking about what information uh, the firms and the consumers are considering when they make their decision. So let's think about a situation then where there are costs, we'll start with that example, the same thing holds true for benefits, but where we'll think about a situation where there are costs beyond those which just the firm um, has to manage. So what we're going to be talking about here then is a situation of negative externality. So we're going to be thinking about a situation where the business uh, the firm is producing its product and there are costs to itself, things like the cost of raw materials, the cost of their staff and so on and so on, but there are going to be other costs as well to uh, people around the business. So let's say this business is um, uh, involved in perhaps the manufacture of paint or something like that and there's, uh, there's obviously some chemical waste products and pollution as a result of this. How is that, how are we going to represent this on the diagram? Well we know, as we've just said, that when the firm is deciding whether to produce or not, it will be thinking about the costs to itself. So somehow on this diagram, we need to reflect the fact that there are these other costs, these external costs, these third party costs, which are not being reflected. So what we're basically saying then is that on top of all of these private costs, there is extra cost. There is this external cost. So what that means is if we're going to take this into account, when the firm is considering output at each price level, really it should be thinking the costs are higher than they are because there are these extra external costs. So it may well be the case that the firm thinks that their costs are at this level, but actually because of the externality, that point should be up here somewhere because the actual costs to society are greater than just those of the firm. And this is true all the way down the supply curve that 
at each level of output, the the costs to society as a whole are greater than those to just the firm. And then what happens when we join these up is that we get um, another curve. Now we obviously can't call this curve supply because we've already got a supply curve and we can't label it S1 or something like that because that would mean that this line had shifted, which is not the case. Um, what this line represents is the, the total cost to society of production at, at each of those particular levels of output. So what we label this curve as is the marginal social cost. So what does this actually mean? It means that the red line now represents the total cost to society. And the fact that it's on, t on top of the marginal private cost means that we have additional external cost, i.e. a negative externality. So let's just think um, about another uh, common mistake, I suppose, that, um, the, the, that we see a great deal. And that's mixing up external cost and social cost. So let's just uh, consider a particular output level. So we're going to think about, uh, we'll, we'll think about this output level here. So that we're using a line that we've already done. So we're going to call this output level Q1. So when the business is producing output level Q1, how are these costs made up? Well, what we have then is essentially a few different bits. We've got from zero up to the supply curve, these are the private costs. So the private costs are the costs between uh, the, the horizontal axis and the supply curve. They are the private costs, the ones that the firm is taking into account. We've then got the external costs and the external costs, let's take a lemony yellow, uh, the external costs are the costs from here to here. So the external costs are the costs which are in addition to the private costs. And what we then have are the social costs. And the social costs go all the way from this curve all the way down to the axis. So we've got the private cost, which is the distance between the blue lines, the external cost, the distance between the yellow lines, and the social cost, the distance between the red lines. So what we can quite clearly see there is that the private cost plus the external cost equals the social cost. And it's very important for that reason that you distinguish between external cost and the social cost. It, it's quite a common uh, mistake. Uh, generally, people write social when they mean external. Um, but, um, but, but obviously, some, you know, they are different concepts, as you can see quite clearly on the diagram. So really, what, um, what that video was, was designed to do was to just show you how the, uh, the kind of the market failure diagram is really just a development of a diagram that you already know, which is the supply and demand diagram. So try not to think of it as a completely new diagram which needs to be learnt. Uh, think about it as a development of one that you already know. Now, the implication of all of that, obviously, is that the current equilibrium level, what we call the market equilibrium level, um, which is here, so we'll label this PM and QM for the market equilibrium, is actually not at the optimal level. It's not in the best place for society. The best place for society is here, because if we're there, then we are taking account of these, of all of the social costs. So we're taking account of the external costs as well. What does that mean then? Well, it means that that in this situation, we are looking at the fact that the market is producing the wrong amount of this product. It, it's not producing the allocatively efficient amount. The market is producing at QM because QM is where we end up when we take account of the firm's uh, costs and the consumer's benefits. But really, we should be at Q star. If we were taking, if the firm was taking account of all of its costs rather than just the ones that it, it has to bear itself, if it was taking account of all the costs, it would only be producing Q star. So what we've got is this gap in between 
here, which means that when we have a negative externality, we have over production of this particular product. So there is allocative inefficiency in this market. So I hope that explains a little bit more about uh, about the market failure diagram. Um, it, it's not something to be scared of. And if you can understand how it relates back to uh, your studies of demand and supply from earlier on in the course, I actually hope it should start to make a lot more sense to you.